Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. After a whirlwind week in Germany, Governor General Mary May Simon and APTN's dynamic duo of reporters have returned to Canada. Tonight we're looking back at the trip and its celebratory Canada night. Here's Lindsay Richardson with a wrap up. It was a high point of the Governor General's recent state visit to Germany, the Frankfurt Book Fair's Canada Night, in all its colors, where spectators also became performers. The words are Widow Gawe, can say it back, Widow Gawe. Governor General Mary May Simon knows the importance of nights like these. We have a duty to listen to Indigenous voices and to learn from them. And performers, in turn, recognize the example being set by Simon's historic appointment. I was thrilled. I was absolutely thrilled. It's progress. That's what it feels like. That's what it looks like. Seeing that, that um, representation in all of our different elements is you know, priceless. The state visits rollout was rigorous, a combination of political and cultural outings. There were meetings with Germany's most prominent leaders, roundtables on issues specific to Canada's north, and several museum tours. In a sit-down interview with APTN News, Simon explained it's all about striking a balance. You know, I have to look at it in a way where I'm... My priority is always Indigenous issues uh, because I'm Indigenous, but at the same time I need to remember, and I, and, I, and I do, that I am representing all Canadians. And while it's one thing to travel across the world and see cultural items on display, it's another thing to do it while feeling culturally supported. That's where these women come in. My Cree name loosely translated into English is Sky Dancer. I'm Cree. Um, my given name is Louise Bernice Half. Louise Bernice Half is the first Indigenous Parliamentary Poet Laureate of Canada and one of the delegates attending as cultural support for Simon. It challenged my core values, like I'm not used to. Uh, uh, formal dress, formal behavior, and having to wash my mouth. <laughs> you know? Half spent seven years at Blue Quill's residential school in Alberta. She says parts of the trip and its discussions were painful, but are necessary in the long run. Sometimes my anger and my bitterness is like way up there, right? And at other times I'm okay and calm. And, and if it hadn't been for my personal therapy and going back to um, uh, our uh, spiritual practices, I wouldn't be able to do the work that I do. Uh, and it's so important to be uh, not only intellectual about it, but to have the emotional breath with it so that you can reach people and educate the public. Uh, but when you have an Inuk Governor General in office, you also have to represent the far north. That's Lisa Koparkwaluk's area of expertise, speaking to issues specific to Nunavik, while also learning from Germany's efforts to reconcile with its own people. We see that um, the experience of the Jews here has been particularly hard, and also, in a sense, um, satisfying, because it's really good to see the efforts that the German society makes to acknowledge uh, the wrongs that had happened in the past. And so it makes me see the possibilities of what can be done to really show and reconcile with past wrongs, uh, just as uh, so much wrongs have happened, had happened in Canada. She says Germans had questions about service gaps in mental health services and education in the Arctic and Simon's northern culture. And we don't want to concentrate on just the terrible things that have happened. We acknowledge them, mm -hmm. for sure. But we also want to celebrate our culture, who we are, uh, 
what brought us to where we are today and what are those incredible um, uh, intelligent things that have allowed us to be able to live in an environment that we love. Even half a world away, the goal was to flip the script on indigenous issues, to ground Germany's fascination with First Nations with facts, while making it clear past pain won't hinder future progress. Tonight, above all, I hope that a small piece of Canada will find a home in your hearts, just as it has in ours. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Frankfurt. To Iqaluit now, where City Council provided an update to the ongoing water crisis today. They've potentially found the reason for toxic water in Nunavut's capital. Potentially contaminated soil is the most likely source of petroleum hydrocarbons that were detected in the city's drinking water. Flushing of the water system was expected to be completed this week, but will now extend into next week. The city will also test the soil earlier next week and decide their next move when the results come back. They've added water monitoring to find hydrocarbons as soon as they appear. Calouet has been without potable water for 11 days now. The chief of a First Nation in Manitoba is facing numerous charges, including sexual assault with a weapon. Manitoba RCMP say they investigated after a report of inappropriate texts between a 16-year-old female and a 65-year-old male. In September, they determined Chief Raymond Keeper of Little Grand Rapids First Nation was the 65-year-old male. He was arrested October 21st. He is facing eight charges, including luring a person under 18, being a person in a position of authority and touch for a sexual purpose. Little Grand Rapids is a flying community 280 kilometers north of Winnipeg. Calls to Chief Keeper's office were not returned. RCMP believe there may be more victims. They asked survivors or anyone with information to call Little Grand Rapids RCMP at 204-397-2249. The Northwest Territories government is facing a homeless crisis. For the second year in a row, they've declared a local state of emergency to open a temporary day shelter in downtown Yellowknife. There is a new site for a shelter, but frontline workers say changes are needed for long-term success. Our Charlotte Moore Jacobs has a story. Welcome to Yellowknife, where homelessness meets Band-Aid solutions. The city of just under 20,000 people has one day shelter. But because of demand, they have been relying on temporary day shelters for years and will continue to do so until 2024, when a permanent wellness and recovery center is built. The only shelter in Yellowknife is always full, which means a second temporary shelter is needed before winter. This fall, the territorial government asked City Council permission to use this building as a temporary day shelter. But City Councilors voted against. For the second year in a row, the territorial government has declared a local state of emergency to be able to build a temporary day shelter. This week, the GNWT announced plans to bring in modular buildings to this location behind me to serve as a temporary drop-in. They say it will be able to accommodate up to 50 people, including staff. So what do frontline workers think of all of this? APTN asked. On the other end of town, the Arctic Indigenous Wellness Camp has been healing trauma since 2018. I put her the first week of November because... Staffed with those informed by lived experience, like Patricia Ross. Uh, the homeless people keep me coming back because... To me, they matter, and not too long ago, I was in the same situation as they are. This is typical for camp. Clients drop in and access mental health and addiction supports. William Greenland, a traditional counselor at the wellness camp, says a new temporary shelter keeps things at status quo. What do we need to do for our people? I mean, geez, you know, there's so many homeless people. We're never going to end that. 
we aren't, we could set up places for them, but it's up to the individual to get off the street, to make the change in their life in order to, to get better. They need to do that themselves. Greenland hopes indigenous models of healing will be incorporated. If we can take some of my staff and uh, clone them and put them over in, in, in this new center they're going to create, maybe they might begin to feel better that way somebody is actually listening to them rather than saying, no, you can't come in here, Joe, you've been here already today. We need to let somebody else in today. You know, just come in, you know, and, and maybe they want to take care of something. We don't know what's going on for Joe today. We want to say, what's happening, Joe? You know, what brings you back here again today? What are you, you know, how are you feeling? Charlotte Mort Jacobs, APTN National News, Yellowknife. In the Yukon, a municipal election for the city of Whitehorse was held on Thursday. And for the first time in 30 years, an Indigenous person was elected. Michelle Friesen won the second highest number of votes on the six-seat council. She's also the first Indigenous woman ever to be elected. The first and last Indigenous person to serve on Whitehorse City Council was Ed Schultz, serving from 1991 to 1994. Friesen says she hopes her win will inspire other Indigenous people to run. It doesn't matter what clothes you wear or how much money you have. Um, as long as you know you care about your community and your neighbors and you want to affect positive change, then you're qualified. Congrats, Michelle. Uh, First Nation in BC wants to put the brakes on a planned moose hunt. Details coming up. Welcome back. The McLeod Lake Indian Band is urging the BC Premier to stop the planned cow-calf moose hunt. The BC government is conducting a trial hunt to reduce moose populations to help the dwindling caribou population. The First Nation says the hunt does not align with their traditional knowledge. APTN's Lee Wilson reports. McLeod Lake Indian Band Deputy Chief Jay Chinji stands in front of a sign calling for the protection of cow moose. The BC government has a program reducing moose populations to help with caribou recovery. According to a BC report, understanding caribou declines, the population in BC has gone from 40,000 to 15,500. McLeod Lake Indian Band want both healthy moose and caribou populations. They work with the BC government in reducing cow and calf moose hunting tags from 100 to 60. But last week, their leadership held a press conference calling the BC Premier to stop the hunt completely in their territory. Practice of hunting cow and calf moose. It's being done as a trial to aid in caribou recovery and our Indigenous knowledge, our traditional knowledge, and the way we have been hunting for our time immemorial is saying that that's not correct. It's not going to help. McLeod Lake Territory is located north of Prince George and has over 108,000 square kilometers. The band works with Doug Hurd, a retired wildlife biologist turned independent researcher who operates a feeding program meant to increase endangered caribou in the territory. So the combined effect of feeding and wolf reduction has resulted in doubling in the number of caribou in this population and in the adjacent population where we reduced the number of wolves but did not feed, the increase hasn't been quite so great. When he started in the area in 2014, there were only 48 caribou, but as of 2020, there were 98. According to Hurd, the changing landscape due to logging has a long-term effect. He says the caribou numbers in the province have been on a steady decline for decades. Or and they've been going down, not crashing, but going down slowly, but for decades. And the wolf numbers don't respond anymore. They don't decline as the caribou numbers decline because they're basically sustained by moose. The BC government has been doing wolf calls as well to help the caribou. The McLeod Lake Band wants that to continue. They also call for habitat restoration. We contact the Ministry of Forest and Natural Resources for a comment, but did not receive a response before airtime. The First Nation says they don't want government imposing decisions without their consent. 
Deputy Chief Jinji says there are 203 nations in BC. It is important to include the knowledge holders of those nations. We need an amalgamation of Indigenous knowledge and Western science. And really, at the end of the day, it's, it's going to be better for everyone working together. It's going to have better outcomes for the public. It'll create education and awareness. And ultimately, it's going to show partnership and collaboration between two governments at a time that we need it, at a time of truth, of reconciliation. Lee Wilson, APTN National News, McLeod Lake. Coming up tonight on APTN Investigates, a look back at the story of Cindy Gladue. Cindy Gladue was killed in 2011. Ten years and two trials later, her killer has been convicted of manslaughter. Josh Grummet from APTN Investigates joins us now. A warning, we will be discussing traumatic events in this interview. We'll let you know how to get support right after this. Josh, thanks for being with us. Uh, for those who might not know, what is the significance of Cindy Gladue's case? Her case is especially significant. In 2015, uh, her killer was acquitted in her death, and it sparked na nationwide protests uh, one year before the national inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Also, the horrific and shocking way in which she died uh, caught a lot of attention. It's, uh, it's sensitive, so I'll encourage people to watch the story where we can treat it with some sensitivity. And the fact that part of her body was used as evidence in the courtroom as well. Why did the Supreme Court decide the retrial should go ahead? So the key thing here is Section 276 of Canada's Criminal Code. Section 276 says that if you're going to talk about someone's sexual history before trial, you need to have a special type of hearing to determine whether or not that evidence could be admitted. And in the 2015 acquittal of Gladue's killer, that Section 276 hearing was not had. Uh, there were several reasons that were discussed by the Supreme Court in uh, ordering the retrial, but that was the key thing that the order turned on. So why is Bradley Barton no longer being charged with first-degree murder? The important thing there is that for first-degree murder, one of the considerations is that there needs to be a weapon involved. In the 2015 acquittal, the Crown's case turned on the hypothesizing that there was, in fact, a knife that was used, but there was no murder weapon ever found. Uh, so in the 2021 uh, retrial of Bradley Barton, there was no weapon, so the Supreme Court decided that he would only be tried on manslaughter. Josh, a very important matter indeed. Uh, looking forward to the episode. Thanks for speaking with us about it. No problem. You can catch the full episode tonight on APTN Investigates. If you need support, you can contact the First Nations and Inuit Hope for Wellness line at 1-855-242-3310 or text HOME to 686868. That's the crisis text line for Kids Help Phone. Both lines are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Well, time for another quick break and then a story on Ojibwe spirit horses. Stick around. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. And our photo today comes from our old buddy, Greg Scriver, who captured this golden orange sunset from Petrie Island in the Ottawa River. Be sure to keep those photos coming. Uh, send them to share at apt10.ca for the chance to be featured next week. Thanks again, Greg. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, 16 with showers in St. John's, 17 with rain in Halifax. Two in Kujuak, six and cloudy for Nain. Eight in Montreal, three in Shibugamu. Ten with rain in Sault Ste. Marie, cloudy nine in North Bay. Eight and cloud in Thunder Bay, snow and four in Sioux Lookout. Two in Churchill and God's Lake, where rain is expected. Six for Winnipeg and Dauphin. Sunny and eight in Regina. One degree cooler with the sun out in Saskatoon. Six in Uranium City and Meadow Lake. In northern Alberta, six with showers in Fort McMurray. Five with rain in high level. Eight with rain for Edmonton, 12 in Lethbridge. 
12 with showers for Vancouver and Penticton. 10 with rain in Prince George, 6 in Fort Nelson. Snow and minus 1 for Old Crow, rain and 7 in Whitehorse. 6 for Yellowknife, 5 in Norman Wells. Plus 1 in Saks Harbor, 5 in Pulatuck. 0 for Baker Lake, Chesterfield and Arviette. Minus 2 of snow in Resolute, 4 below and snow in the Glue Lake. An indigenous organization has taken over a 160-acre farm in the west of Ottawa, a Reconciliation Rock Trail. Ojibwe spirit horses and an indigenous art store are all part of it. APTN's Fraser Needham explains more. The Mataoki Farm sits on traditional Algonquin land south and west of downtown Ottawa. Mataoki means share the land in Algonquin. It was taken over by the organization Indigenous Experiences earlier this month. Trina Mather Samard says it's all about the connection to the land. But we did really want to find a location that allowed us to have more of that connection to the land uh, and really be able to share our culture and build our organization in new ways. Um, so we started kind of looking at farm properties and came across this uh, was the former uh, Lone Star Ranch here in Ottawa. The farm's first major event is the Tagwagi or Autumn Festival, which got underway recently. We also have a celebration stage. We are doing the Thanksgiving Address, the Haudenosaunee Thanksgiving Address. Uh, we're also doing a Three Sisters Corn Beans and Squash uh, play along with a powwow dance performance. So again, you know, celebrating some of those harvest activities. One of the highlights of the festival are the Ojibwe spirit horses. They're native to North America and existed on the continent prior to colonization. They were close to extinction in the late 1970s. Rhonda Snow is an Ontario artist. She and a handful of others made it a lifelong passion to revive the breed. And when I was a young girl, I sat around the staircases of the loggers' houses and listening to the stories of the little ponies. And I was so shy, I just hid there waiting for my girlfriend to come out and play. And I heard about these little tiny horses that used to live in the woods and in the bush. And I thought, someday I'm going to find them. Snow would eventually end up owning her own herd of spirit horses and at one point had as many as 60. She says the horses managed to survive post-colonial extinction making them a symbol of Indigenous resilience. Just like the Indigenous people's cultures were stripped from them, the native ponies, their ways of being with their families and herds were stripped from them also. And they, just because they're little, doesn't mean they're mighty. It's the littlest things in nature that are sometimes the most important that get stepped on. And these little ponies did, and so did the culture of the people, the language. The fall festival wraps up this coming weekend. Mather Samard says plans are already in the works to hold a winter festival in early December. I'm Fraser Needham for APTN News, Ottawa. Thanks, Fraser. Welcome to the team. That is all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Friday. For news anytime, you can visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for tuning in. Stick around. APTN Investigates is next. Have a great night.